Give it up, give it up. That's all you got, give it up. That's good, that's good, that's good. <laughs> There's my man. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. I'm enormously pleased to be here today. Uh, I have spent a lot of time in Frisco and the Breckenridge and in th this area here also. It's a favorite place of Colorado. It's just nothing but beauty and wonderfulness. And then being under the gazebo here with a lot of people here is just absolutely wonderful. Thank you so very, very much for uh, coming today. I always appreciate audiences that come. My name is Angel V. Hill. I will tell you a little bit about myself and then we'll just get right into it. I will talk until somebody falls asleep. And then, then I stop, okay? Because <laughs> I got to gauge my audience as best as I can. Okay, then I got my VIP section right up here too. That's always good too. All right. Um, I love history. I'm a scholar. I've written six books. I actually know what I'm talking about. I was telling Jenna here, the person who invited me to come, I could talk 10 hours straight without taking a break or repeating anything, but I'm not going to do that today. I work at the History Colorado Museum in Denver. If you're in Denver on August 1st, it's the birthday of the state of Colorado. 1876, we're called the Centennial State. The reason we're called the Centennial State is because we became a state exactly 100 years after America became a country. So if you're in Denver, it's free day at the museum. Uh, come down to the museum. I'll be there doing a couple of things with a bunch of other uh, entertainers and presenters, but it's a party the museum throws for the state of Colorado. Now, before we get started, I, brought, uh, I have a bunch of different shows that I do. <clears throat> I have five different historical characters that I do. This is one of them. Got to show you the back. The back is cool. Yes, it is. So here's what we got going. A little bit louder. Make it louder. We're going to make it louder. Yes, we are. Okay, so here's what we got going. Everybody hears me? Everybody good? Yeah. All right, good. All right. Um, this is a historically accurate costume from about the 1750s. It's modeled after a picture in the Denver Art Museum by a man named Walker. Big, giant wall hanging picture of vaqueros in California. And what they're doing is they're lassoing a bear, is what they're doing. So I'd seen that picture and I had this custom made for myself because all my characters have to have a, a costume or outfit that's historically accurate. So I had the picture and I took it to the man who custom made this and I said, uh, please make it like this and he did. So this is from about the 1750s, uh, Vaquero Spanish Colonial Cowboy if you want to call it. Now before we get started, so I'm going to be telling the story about El Vaquero, America's first cowboy. But these are rhetorical questions. You don't have to answer them. But in your mind, you got, they've got to have some answer to that question. Why was there John Wayne? Why was there Roy Rogers? Why was there Gene Autry? Why is the football team, the Broncos, named the Broncos? Why do we have tailgate parties before the football game? Why do we eat hamburgers? And this is a profound philosophical existential question. That demands an answer. Why is there McDonald's? <laughs> well, the answer is simple. It's a little ditty, a children's ditty. When I was growing up, and I can see some of you are the same generation as me, every kid knew this. Nowadays, when I give shows in uh, schools, hardly no one's ever heard it, but I know some of you are finished it up for me. The reason there was John Wayne, the reason there was uh, Roy Rogers, the reason there's Gene Autry, the reason the Broncos are named the Broncos, the reason there's hamburgers, the reason we cook out steaks and have meat on July 4th cookouts, the reason there's McDonald's is contained in the little children's ditty. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. That's the answer to all those questions. Because what you fundamentally have to know is this. When Columbus came over to the New World, not a single cow or a single horse was here. So what happens is they brought over large animals that needed to be tended to in large open spaces. So what happens is this. The first horses were brought over 
to the what I call the mainland of uh, the New Americas, New Spain, by Cortez and his crew. He brought over 16 horses. And now from those 16 horses have created, with the cattle they brought over later on, everything we know absolutely about ranch culture, rodeo culture, and cowboy culture came from one person, El Vaquero, America's first cowboy. Now, this person just didn't spring fully formed out of nowhere. It's the end result of the Moorish occupation of Spain for 900 years, from 711 to 1492. And what happens is the Moors had developed, especially in southwestern Spain, the whole, complete, everything about how do you work with large animals in wide open spaces. If you've ever been to southwestern Spain, which I've been to southwestern Spain, if you're driving around Andalusia and you don't look at the road signs, which are in kilometers and in Spanish language, you would definitely and absolutely think you're driving down the front range on the way to Pueblo and Trinidad. Terrain looks exactly the same, exactly the same. So the terrain's the same, sun's out all the time, big sky and everything, and they developed the animals, they developed how to take care of the animals, they developed the language, they developed the clothes that you wear, they developed the tools that you wear, and then when they came to the New World, they not only brought a language, a Spanish language, you can't go around the state of Colorado without running into the Spanish language, towns, rivers, mountains, people. They brought a religion, they brought a culture, they brought food, but for our story today, what they brought was two animals, the cow, in the horse. Now we got to back up a little bit about the word vaquero. Now the word vaquero in the Spanish language, any word that ends with ero means for whatever the first part of the word is. So vaquero, vaca is the word in the Spanish language for cow. It just means someone who's for the cow, right? It does not translate directly to cowboy. Let me tell you about the word cowboy. Word cowboy is a simple word, but it used to be two words cow boy and it'd be a little boy about your age or about your age and the first documented history written down about the word cowboy two words was in the 1100s in ireland and here's what happened a little boy about the age of these boys right here with a stick or a pole would take those sissy england cows the hereford the durham Sissy England cows could be controlled by a little boy out to pasture in the morning, brought back at the end of the day. First documented instance of the word cowboy. Later, during the Revolutionary War for Independence in the United States, the word cowboy, well, those fighting words, again, two words, a cowboy was someone who was stealing cattle from the American patriots to give to the British soldiers. Next time it pops up was in 1848, the great war between the United States and Mexico, where the Mexico lost half of its territory, and the United States gained the whole southwestern part. Uh, once again, a cowboy was a cow thief. Now it was someone from either, either side, the American side or the Mexican side, but the same activity, stealing people to feed the soldiers on whatever side they're on. Then something powerful happened. The Transcontinental Railroad was completed. And these dandies started coming out west. And they ran into El Vaquero, a true man, not a cow boy. Someone handling large animals in wide open spaces. Because the cowboy before had been handling a herd of maybe five or six cattle, the family herd, going down and coming back. But here's a man on the wide open plains of the Southwest handling a thousand head, taking him 1,500 miles, right? With a small crew and outfit of seven or eight other men. So what happens is these dandies came out. They're wearing the boulder hat, wearing the vest, wearing the bow tie, the white shirt. And they started writing these stories, these dime novels, and sending them back east. And what they were writing about was the exploits of the vaquero, this man they ran into out west. A man who would seal the deal with a handshake. A man who would work from sunup to sundown. A man who was polite to women and children. A man said what he meant and means what he said. 
They'd never run into a man like that before. But more than that, a man who knew how to handle wide open spaces filled with wide, wild animals. Because when the Spanish came over, not only did they bring the 16 horses, they brought three breed of cattle. One of them was a Spanish fighting bull. Let me tell you about the Spanish fighting bull. Instinct to charge, not afraid of people, mean-tempered. You let that DNA circulate around the Southwest for several hundred years, you know what he end up with? The Texas Longhorn. Instinct to charge, not afraid of people, mean-tempered. If you're ever in Denver, when the, the stock show is starting in January, it's a big tradition. Down the middle busy street of Denver, always, they run a herd down there, eight feet from tip to tip with those longhorns that they're bringing down and everything. It takes a special type of man to work with a Texas longhorn. 10,000 head, 100,000 acres in South Texas, the cattle of cowboy, cult, the cradle of cow, cowboy culture in the Americas. Only one man knew how to do that. You're truly El Vaquero, America's first cowboy. Now I do like telling stories. I am the state heritage artist for Hispanic storytelling. So another show I could give could just be the traditional stories in Hispanic Southwest in Mexico. Again, tell stories nonstop for 10 years. Today I'm gonna to tell just a couple of stories, but the first one I wanna tell is this one about the hat. Now I see kind of something resembling a cowboy hat back there. Um, I'm gonna, okay, how many of you, any of you own a cowboy hat? Tell me what it's like, describe it to me. It's got a long brim. Long brim? So that uh, you can, and it has uh, a little hook underneath it. A little hook, okay, okay. okay. It does the brim tilt up? Is it? Yeah. Is there a crease in the top? Yeah. Okay. He described what I would call a, a traditional cowboy hat, kind of like the hat the man had on back there, the brown hat like that. Just took it off and waved at us. Okay. Now here's what I want to let you to know. Everything about cowboy ranch and rodeo culture came from the Spanish culture. Came from El Vaquero, especially the clothes. How do you dress when you're working with these animals? in wide open spaces. One, you have to have the right hat. Now here's what happens. This is a legendary story, but I do want to tell you what's great about this legend. It's true. <laughs> Does anyone here own a Stetson hat? A man has his hat up, hand up. Okay. okay, now I know something about these two guys over there. One, paid a lot of money for that hat. Yes, he did. Two, he knows that's the best hat and he was willing to spend a lot of money to have a Stetson hat. Now here's a story about how that happened. Every single cowboy hat you see today in the American Southwest or in the Americas or worldwide came from this hat. The American hat derived from the Spanish vaquero hat. Let me tell you what happened. So the vaqueros, they were in this hat. If you go to Spain, you're gonna see this hat in the flamenco dancers. Spanish hat. If you go to Argentina and go to one of the rodeos down there, they're gachos. Their culture did not evolve away from the Spanish roots. It stayed true to the Spanish roots. Their American cowboy culture evolved away from the Spanish roots. So they'll be wearing a hat like this, exactly like this, because they're gachos. So here's the story about how this hat became that hat. Okay? Here's what we got going. John B. Stetson, he's living in Philadelphia. Now John B., let me tell you about John B. He belonged to a family of hatters. And they made out of beaver skin, beaver felt, the dandy's bowler hat, Abraham Lincoln's tall stove pie hat. They knew how to make hats out of beaver felt. Now here's what happens. John B., coming from a family of hatters, had the skill, the artistry, and the craft of making hats out of animal skin. But he suffered from a disease called consumption. Nowadays, we call it tuberculosis. Now, believe it or not, back then, medicine wasn't evolved enough to know what really caused consumption. There was only one prescription for it, to come out west. Because they believed the polluted industrial air, air of the northeast part of the United States caused this breathing, the lungers, they call them, right? 
cause this disease of breathing and that the lungers, in order to be cured, had to come out west. Clear sky, clean air. That was the prescription for tuberculosis or consumption. So John B. had consumption. He comes out west, hoped to get better. Now, he's out west, and I got to tell you, when you come out west on a hot day, you know, on the open plains, if you have the wrong hat, you're going to suffer. Now, this was after the Civil War. So most of the men with him had what's called the soldier's cap. Small little cap, like a baseball cap, tiny little brim, soldier's cap. Or they had the farmer's cap, small little hat, small little brim. Or they had what I call the Gabby's Hay, Hay, Gabby Hayes cap, the slouch hat it was called, just a rag thrown on top of your head. Only one man had the right hat for working in the wide open sun or the wide open plains of the big sky of the American West. And that was El Vaquero. He knew what had to wear. Had to have a white brim, had to have a big crown, air circulation. Now, let me tell you about the brim. If you go down to Mexico, and their, their big hat's called a sombrero, right? Now, there's a reason for that, language-based. Remember I told you in the Spanish language, any word that ends with E-R-O just means it's for whatever the first part of the word is. So a sombrero, a sombraero, in the Spanish language, sombra means shade or darkness, right? So it really means it's a hat for the shade on your face, a sombrero. So the idea of a wide brim was essential in a big crown. So the men are saying, John B., we're dying out here. We got the wrong hat. We need a better hat. We need a hat like that man. And they're pointing to this hat, right? Say, hey, John B., I hear you can make some hats. Yeah, I can make some hats. Can you make that hat? Yeah, I can make that hat. Easy, easy, nothing to it. Got to look at it for a while. So here's how the legend goes. John B. made this hat out of half and half beaver felt. Be, uh, not by felt, I don't mean that thing you use on arts and craft. Felt actually refers to animal skin. Beaver felt, rabbit felt. Made this special the the mix. Made this hat, right? Made this hat. Now he's walking around, around with a sombra ero, okay? So here's what happens. Man comes up to him and says, hey, John B., got to have that hat you're wearing. I'll give you a $5 gold piece for that hat. John B. sells him the hat. Hey, you won't believe what happened. The fresh air and sunshine, John B. starts to feel better. A small little side to this is, you know, in Denver is the um, Jewish hospital. It's world renowned for respiratory diseases. The reason that it was founded to treat consumptive patients coming out west. And the treatment was they would just roll you out in the sun, is all they do, and then roll you back is what they would do. So John B's getting better. He goes back to Philadelphia. You know what he's thinking about? That $5 gold piece is what he's thinking about. That's what he's thinking about. He says, wow, that man gave me that $5 gold piece for that hat. I can make as many of those hats as I want to. So he left his, he's left the family business, started his own business, the John B. Stetson Hat Company. By the early part of the 1900s, John B. Stetson Hat Company was sending out west two million hats a year. The reason is, it was a good hat. You could fan the fire with it, make the horse go faster. You could use it as a pillow. You could shoot a bullet through it, it still worked. By smell alone, you could identify your own hat, is what they would say. And then what they would do is this. You could bring water to your horse with the hat, right? So the John B. Stetson hat, direct descendant of this hat. But he made a couple of changes. I actually think they're for the good. One of them was addressing the vanity of the seventh grade girl. Now you might wonder where am I going to put this. I'm going to tell you I'm going to put this. I'm going to put you at the stock show. In Denver, these cowboys, right, they come into Denver to buy a new hat. Now, the stock show, if you buy a new hat, the brim's always flat. They steam it right on the site for you, and you stand in front of a mirror with your hat. And so one of the things was you can shape the brim, right, away from the flat brim. So this is what I call it the vanity of the seventh grade girl. I see these real macho cowboys in front of the mirror 
with their hat being steamed? I don't know. What do you think? Maybe like this? What do you think? Okay, steam it. Okay. And then once it dries, it's all hard and everything. So the idea that you could personalize the brim was a change. But the other thing he did was how do you take the hat on and off? Because a, you can always tell a real cowboy when they take the hat off, always crown down. Don't put it on the brim. Reason is you spend a lot of time shaping that brim, right? And you don't want it to break down by putting it down. Always crown down. So what happens is this. To take this hat off, I don't like taking this hat off. I have to grab it by the brim because my hand's not big enough really to be doing this all the time, right? So the idea of an indention that with three fingers you can reach up and take the hat off, that's what I call a technological advancement of a utilitarian object, your hat. How are you going to take it on and off? The first hat was called the Boss of the Plains. Didn't have much of a, of a rim uh, adjustment then. Had a very high crown, right? Had a very high crown. Want to tell one more story about the, the idea of the hat. Now, remember when cultures come together, language jumps cultures. And in southern Texas, all these Anglos were coming in, and they ran into the El Vaquero, working with a bunch of large animals in wide open spaces. But all the vaqueros are speaking Spanish. So almost every term used in cowboy ranch or rodeo culture is directly derived from the Spanish language because all, of our, all the Anglos coming into South Texas just started using the same language that the vaqueros were using to describe the work you do to handle large animals in wide open spaces. So what happens is this. Here's one example. You all know what the 10-gallon hat is? It's a hat with a giant brim, right? I mean a crown, giant crown, right? Now, a lot of people think the 10-gallon came from volume, that it must hold 10 gallons. That's not where the name of that hat came from. Here's where the name of that hat came from. In the Spanish language, there's a, it's a, a archaic now. It's not used much anymore. There was a phrase, tangalan. See where this is going? <laughs> and tangalan is almost untranslatable. It's idiomatic. It means, cool, dude. <laughs> OK, that's what it means. So what happens is the hacendado, the owner of the ranch, would come in. And the hacendado, well, he's dressed fancy, right? He's dressed fancy. And one of the ways that you can show off is by how many bands of silver, hat bands of silver, are on your hat. So the more hat bands of silver you had, the richer you were. But the more you had, the taller the crown had to be, right? So the vaqueros, they would see a man coming in, the hacendado, the owner of the hacienda, with his big old hat, right? With all the silver rims going up. And they'd hear the vaquero saying, oh, that hombre is tan galan, right? And they just started thinking that hat must be a tan galan hat. And then language always jumps, and then it became the 10-gallon hat. There, I really got a 1,000 of these. The word rodeo comes from the Spanish word rodear, which just means to gather up in a circle. One of my favorite is the huscao. You know what the huscao is? Huscao comes from the Spanish word juzgado, which means the courthouse. So if you're going to the juzgado, you're going to jail because you're going to the courthouse, right? And the hanging judge is going to be there. So the word huzgal came from the word huzgado. The word jerky, beef jerky, came from the word uh, charcar, which just means to cut beef into strips and everything. The word lasso came from the Spanish word lazo, which just means a snare or a trap. The word lariat came from the Spanish word laureata, which just means the rope. So I'm not making it up. The clothes, the way you do it, the tools you use and everything came directly from the Spanish language. Now, told you the story about the hat. I love telling the stories about how things happen. I want to show you some stuff. I bring a lot of show and tell here, right? Now, these are my working spurs, all right? Let me tell you what's cool about these spurs. These spurs are about 150 years old. They should be in my museum under a plastic case, right? They're museum. But usually I wear them, and I'm not wearing them today because this is a different type of talk. So what's cool about them, they're made of iron, and they're Spanish. There's a uh, silver. 
in uh, Mexico, the silver mines were really uh, abundant. So that uh, something as utilitarian as a spur would have uh, silver inlay is cool. And then the little dangles here like this, and the rowel, this is a Mexican rowel, Spanish rowel. The rowel is really big. The modern rowel is called the uh, Texas rowel. It's, it's about an inch around, and it's more wavy. It's not spiky like this. If you ever see a horse that's all scratched up on the flanks, then you know the rider of the horse is not only a cruel person, but doesn't know what he's doing, right? You should never have to resort to going on, going to the spurs. If you're right, if uh, people working with large animals in wide open spaces and you're riding a horse, two animals have to be trained. One is the horse. The other animal that has to be trained is the rider, right? The rider and the horse are, are trained up. You don't need this. You control it with the knees, the taps, which are tapaderos, coverings to the stirrups the range, the way you talk to the horse. If you're one unit, you don't need these. If you have to go to these, something serious is broken down because you're going to damage your horse. Animal skin, we uh, leather, we use it for belts, clothes, uh, any number of things, right? On the animal, the skin is like our skin. It's very thin, actually. Feels pain, gets cut, gets infected, and you don't want to do that to your animal. Okay, now I am looking at you. <laughs> They're keeping me honest over here. <laughs> I'm looking at you. And the reason is I'm going to do something. I'm going to pass stuff around. This is like kindergarten. All I ask is all my stuff comes back here, does not go home with you. Okay? <laughs> Here, check that out. It's cool. It's cool. I want you to see it. Check it. I got two of these. Check it out. Pass this around. Just make sure it gets back up to me and everything. Now, remember I told you down in uh, Argentina, they didn't evolve away, away from the Spanish roots? In Argentina, they don't wear that. You know what they wear? They wear this. Now, this is cool. Okay. This is a type of spur the conquistadores would have wore when they came over. Large rowel, right? Large, large rowel like this, but very ornately stamped. The reason it's ornately stamped is remember I told you the Moors uh, from 711 to 1492 were in charge of the Spanish Peninsula. And if you've ever been over there, especially a place like the Alhambra in, in Madrid, th their decorative uh, aesthetic is very ornate and detailed. So this spur reflects the influence of the Moorish culture that the Spanish brought over when they brought over, basically, how do you work with cattle and horses in wide open spaces? They brought over all the equipment. So this is here. I want to show you something about this, though. This is too heavy to wear like this. So you have to wear a ledge because the spur is too heavy to be unsupported on your boot like this. Pass that around. Check this out. So you have, uh, you gotta have the hat. A short-waisted coat is for a reason. You're in the saddle all day long, right? <laughs> So you don't want like a bunch of stuff down here, right? So short-waisted coat, the flamenco uh, outfit is like this, the vaquero outfit like this. I know, especially in the Southwest, all the way from really Colorado, Texas, all the way to California, you're going to run into mariachis all the time, right? They're going to be dressed exactly like this. Mariachi music is like, uh, Mexico has 32 states. Every state has its own cuisine. Every state has its own music. Every state has its own dance costume. Uh, the mariachis are from the state of Jalisco. Their costume exactly co copied from this costume, short sombrero, and then a button-down um, pants like this. So then you got to have another tool. The other tool you have to have 
To do this work, you got to do two things. You got to ride a horse, you got to know how to rope. If you don't know how to ride a horse and you got to know how to ride a rope, then you're going to be uh, fixing the fence. That's what you're going to be doing. <laughs> now, what you got to do is this. Got to know how to make the loop. Got to do the loop. This is called the Texas flat spin. There's a lot of tricks to do, but I'm constricted by space here. You ready? I'm going to catch you. You ready? Yo, don't give me that face. Huh? You want to be caught? <laughs> okay, so you got to know how to rope. Now, this rope's a trick rope, right? It's, made, it's uh, called a diamond spot. This is not a rope. They, they sell this at the hardware store. Wrong rope. Don't buy it because this rope actually has a little stiffener in it because to do tricks with the rope you need this rope the rope they sell at the hardware store that looks like this doesn't have the stiffener so it's no good now but the rope is important now today if you want to go get rope just go to something called a tax store and just and you tell them how long you want it right but back in the day you didn't have a tax store you had to make your own rope so here's what you got this is a horsehair rope love this rope reason is it's pretty this is, uh, uh, I call, a very dull horsehair rope. It's just like kind of bays and grays and blacks and everything. But horsehair, you know, horses come in a lot of different colors. And uh, their, their manes are different colored all the time, depending upon what the body is, what, what uh, breed of horse that it is. So I've seen horses with, that are blonde and red-haired and rust-colored and everything. So you get a horse really different colored. Now, the thing of this rope is, uh, the, ed, the end of it is very oily. Now, this is horse hair, right? From the mane and the tail. It's not what I'd call a really durable rope because it's an organic material, horse hair, which means over time, it, it, it's pretty strong, but if you're using this all day long for boo, doing the hard work, it's going to stretch, it's going to break eventually, right? But you could make a rope out of horse hair. It feels oily on the end. You know why that is? Horses don't shampoo their hair. Yeah. What's your hair like after three, four days? Well, it's going to feel like this, won't it, right? Okay, so do this. It's very, very prickly. Be aware. Now, the other type of rope would be this rope. Now, this rope's cool. Braided leather. People that make this rope, they're all dead. This is a lost art right? Anyone that does this is an artist in working in a lost art. Reason is you don't need to braid leather anymore to get a rope. So here's what happens. Here's what's unique about this. You know how you get braids and you braid them into three pieces, three, three strands? This is four strands. So imagine braiding something this tight with four strands, truly a lost art. And then this is, uh, this is, this rope is, ooh, this rope could be as long as from here to the, where the tent is right there, the swab tent. Very long rope. So you're not going to get a strip of leather like that off of a cowhide. You're going to have to braid it in is what you're going to have to do. I've examined this a lot looking for where the braid in is. You can kind of tell every now and then. But I basically, you can, this is called the Honda, the, like the car name, the, where'd it go, the loop. So you can see where that's all braided in, of course, you know. But I can't find where they connected it together. It, the craftsmanship is just too fine. So this would be in a museum also, very, very, very super cool. But this is a lost art, pass that around, check it out. Now the modern rope is this rope. What do you think that's made out of? Does it tickle your nose? No. Does it tickle your nose? <laughs> no. Tickles my nose. Okay. Looks like strands of cotton, right, is what it looks like. The modern rope, and when you go to the tax store, you just say rope. That's what you call it, rope. Is um, made of plastic. Poly nylon, right? Extremely strong. That's what's good about it. Uh, I don't like it so much because when it gets wet, it's like plastic. It gets real slick. But uh, you're wearing gloves anyway, so you just grab a hold of it. If I were to burn this, you'd smell that real acrid, smart, 
sharp smell of plastic burning. The beauty of this is, and I've had cowboys come up and tell me, why do you say that? That's so disrespectful. That was insulting, but true. <laughs> you don't have to be very good at your loop. Reason is, it's a very stiff rope, and I'm not going to take it apart because I'm going to pass it around. So when you're doing this, the rope holds the loop, right? Because it's a very stiff rope. The secret of good roping nowadays with this is not in the loop or the throw. Be really close to that animal, right? That's the secret. Because don't forget, that animal doesn't want to get caught. So that animal is bobbing and weaving and left and right and everything, you know. So you want to be really close. So you're booming it from on top or underneath. The secret, as close as you can be, is the way to be successful with the modern rope. Okay, there we go. There we go. Hey. Deep inside of you is locked someone who's been squashed, put away, forgotten. But for a moment, I encourage you, let the child come out. And the reason is, I want to teach you how to rope. <laughs> Here's what we're going to do. Don't be shy. I bring a lot of them. The reason I bring a very diverse show is I could do the college uh, academic professor talk because it's true. I'm a scholar. I've written six books. I work at a museum. I know a bunch of stuff, right? That's the most boring talk I do. It just is. The only reason people sit through it because they're in a class I'm teaching and they know I'm going to give them a test about it later on. But for these types of talks, I like to have a bunch of variety. I tell stories. I fool around. I pass around stuff. And I like to teach people how to do the loop, right? So then you can catch things, OK? OK, now I got a bunch of these. And we have some space up here. So we're going to do it out here. Who wants to come? Right out here, right now. Okay, go out there. Come on out. Let's go. Let's make this happen. Come on out. Yes, I want you to come out. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Come on out. Come on out. But out here. Come and stand out here. Come stand out here. Come watch, these, watch these cords. Come and stand out here. Oh, you want to do this? I thought you might want to do this. One for you. One for you. Go ahead. Come out here. Come out here. Come out here. One for you. One for you. Go ahead. Come on out. Come on out. I got some more. The child. Let the child out. Let the child out. Come on. Come on. Yes, 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 yes. How are we doing? Yes, come on out. Come on out. It's a lot of fun. Believe me, it's a lot of fun. Thank you. Come on out. I got three more. Three more. One, two, three. Okay, now we'll go. There we go. There we go. Okay. Out of luck. Out of luck. Just, just, just come on. Just in time. Just in time. Okay, now. I got it. No, you don't have it. Okay, here, come on out. Okay, now everybody, spread out, spread out, spread out. Make some room. Okay, put your arm out in front of you. Shake it around, crazy. Don't do that again. Put your arm out, just the wrist. First thing, whoa, look at this. This man was born to be a vaquero. Stretch it out a little bit. Just the wrist, nice and easy. Going around like this, nice. Wow, everybody's doing it, I like oh, this. I Just no, 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 no. How would they, would this I'll, make it I'll, I'll tell you another thing about it, okay. <laughs> looking good, looking good. Okay, give me the roads back. Everybody come and sit down. I gotta tell you more about this. Thank you so much for taking part. Now one person asked me about these ropes. These are tricked up. And the reason is, when I do demonstrations like this, I want people to have success. Now, you notice almost, almost everybody kind of got it, right? Right away. And the reason is they're tricked up, they're glued on, they got this swivel thing up here. Now, the reason I don't give anyone a real piece of rope 
is this. When you're spinning rope, the rope's going to kink on itself. And so if you're just spinning it, because on this rope, this is spinning like this. So that means the rope's spinning on itself and it's not getting kinked up. But on a regular rope that's not tricked up, if you don't spin it, this gets all like this almost immediately. I want to move over there just because I got to show more room here. Could you move over just a little bit more? Thank you. Okay, because I want you to watch this hand. As I'm doing it, I'm spinning like this because I'm having to spin the rope at the very same time I'm spinning the rope. Try to do it up high like this. You see what I'm doing with this hand? Yeah. See, because I have to keep spinning the rope with this hand because watch what happens. The minute I stop that, it's all kinked up. That's too hard to learn at one time. <laughs> That's something if you're going to be a trick rope, you actually have to practice. Now, going to get wild and crazy. You all ready? I'm talking wild and crazy. Okay, because the whip. Oh. <laughs> so riding on the horse, if you're right-handed, you keep your rope right here. You tie it in the back on the saddle back here with these latigo strips with the little strips of leather. Keep it on the back here like this, right? Then what happens is this. You never hit an animal with a whip. And the reason is it reveals your essential cruelty in that you like being mean to animals. And remember I told you about animal skin? That is very, very thin. And you don't want to create damage to a, a wounded animal out on the trail because you don't have the vet there, right? So here's a story with a whip. Cattle. You got to move them. It's a small crew, seven or eight guys. Got maybe 100, 1,000, 1,500 head. You got to move them from South Texas to Wichita, right? Let me tell you about cattle. They don't want to move. You know what they want to do? They want to eat food. <laughs> this is a big event in a cow's life. Over here. That made the big event for the day. They don't want to move, especially when you bedded him down at night, because you usually bed him down with a food source and a water source, right? So in the morning, they know the food and water's right here. They don't want to go another 10 miles, right? No, they're quite happy where they are. You got to move him. Now, what are we going to do? I know what we'll do. Ah! They don't want to move. I know what we're going to do. <laughs> come on, boy. Come on, boy. They don't want to move. I got to move him. Right? Now, here's the deal. Cattle. They're very jittery animals, right? They're, they have a nervous personality. That's why they stampede. The smallest thing will set a whole herd off, right? My favorite one is they saw the full moon coming up over the horizon. Ah, they took off, right? So the jittery animals, so you're going to use that. Remember the knowledge of how to work with large animals in wide open spaces? So you're going to use the knowledge of the psychology of the animal to have the animal move itself, basically. The other thing is, you don't move, have to move a thousand head. How many do you have to move? One. one, the bell cow. You only need to move one. There's a great story about Old Blue. Old Blue, I'll tell you the short, short, short version. Old Blue never went to the slaughterhouse. And the reason is Old Blue was a very calm leader type personality of cattle. And so Old Blue would go all the way up the trail, and then they'd bring Old Blue back. Because Old Blue, the bell cow, had to lead another herd back up the trail. You know that old joke about more, more cowbell, right, on band? More cowbell. Well, the cowbell is a real thing that hung around. It wasn't something on the drummer's kit, right, for rock and roll music. It was a real bell around the cow's neck. So they only needed to move one. 
Now, the other thing about cattle, they're a herd animal. Have a herd instinct. And just like people, if we were to walk along all the time, we would always slot into some places. The same people would always be in the front, same people would always be in the middle, same people would always be at the rear. Cattle are the same way. They slot themselves in there, right, following the bell cow. But you, got, you have to get the cattle paying attention that you're going to move. And that's what the whip is for. Now, this is a small whip. It's about eight feet long. It's my demonstration whip. The real whip would be maybe 12 feet long, much longer. And what you do is this. You ride up to the herd. You crack the whip over the herd, right? The cattle, they're doing their thing. They hear that crack. Whoa! 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 What's going on? What's going on? What was that sound? What was that sound? The mind of the cow, right? So then what happens is this. Then you flank him in the shape of a U. Some men on the flank that keep it in like this. And then the men ride and drag in the back, keep the stragglers in the back up. And you leave the front part open. And up there is riding the trail boss and the bell cow and everything, you know. And the cattle are literally, whoa, 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 big, big thing, big thing. Man on a horse, right? Whoa, 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 ding, ding, ding. Oh, OK, I'll go this way. You know. <laughs> I'm making light of it. But if you know what you're doing, that's about it. <laughs> Let me show you. There's a lot of types of whips. One of them is the circus whip, Clyde Beatty. Short little whip. Blanks in a chair with the lions and tigers in the cage cracking over the top like this You don't want to do the whip like that Because the cracks coming back at the horse's head right bad idea There's a s crack like this You don't want to do that because then the cracks coming back into the flank of the horse You don't want to do that you want to do what's called the overhand reverse You're out like this cracking over the top of the animals like that. Let me show you Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everybody got their phones out? You getting it down? Put it on the internet tonight? One more because it's fun! Okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to tell the story, and then it's over. Now, oh, I was talking to Jana before. She said the main comment they get is always, I wish he'd gone on or she'd gone on longer and done more, more of this and everything, you know. But um, I'm going to tell the story, and then we'll have been here for about an hour. Nice and tight little show and everything. Before I end up, I want to thank Jana for inviting me to come. I want to thank all of you for coming. You made the show, actually. And let me tell you a story. Um, I, I'm not even exaggerating. At the drop of a hat, I have a hundred different stories ready to go. I'm going to tell you one of them, the legend of the falling stars. Now, vaqueros, cowboys, late at night, sitting around the campfire. Got nothing to do. So they just talk, tell stories to each other. This is one of the stories they tell to each other. This is actually one of the favorite stories they tell to each other. The legend of the falling stars. The legend of the falling stars says, when you're out in the open late at night, and you see the falling stars streaking down, they're not falling stars. What they really are, they're precious jewels thrown down from the heavens by the gods themselves as gifts to hard-working vaqueros. So that if you find them, you can become an hacendado, the owner of the hacienda, the ranch. You can wear the sombrero tan galan. In your hard life of vaquero, working with large animals on wide open spaces is over. 
in the life of ease and respectability is ahead of them. So they especially listen to the legend of the falling stars. Now the falling star says they're really not falling stars, they're precious jewels thrown down by the gods from the heavens themselves. And if you find them, well here's how the story goes. One night a vaquero had heard this story around the campfire. And he was riding herd that night. Now he don't sleep all night long. Nobody does that. What happens is this. You gotta ride herd for two hours. One vaquero going one way, one going the other way. And your job is to keep the herd bedded down, no stampede. So what happens is this. You just sing to the cattle. Now I don't have a great voice. Most vaqueros don't. But the cattle, they don't care. For some reason, the sound of the human voice is very settling to cattle. So as you're riding your two-hour shift late at night, you're just making up songs. In fact, a lot of the old cowboy songs were originated in this way. Cowboys is making up songs, riding herd late at night. So they're riding herd around like this. And one vaquero, he looks up and he sees the falling stars streaking down from the night skies. And they're coming down, they're coming in hot, right? So he sees where they land and then he follows them very quickly. And what he does, he gets there and he pulls out his boot knife. And they're buried, they're hot embers, they bury themselves under the ground, but he can see them still glowing under the ground. So he gets the boot knife and he digs them up and then he, when they cool off in his hands, he sees that. <laughs> the legend is true. They were not falling stars because in his hands are rubies, emeralds, sapphires, diamonds. He's rich. So he puts him in his war bag right here. Usually all that's in there is tobacco and paper, rolling paper. But he finishes his two-hour shift and goes back to sleep in his bedroll. He wakes up in the morning and he goes, oh, that was a great dream. That might have been the best dream I've ever had in my life. Then he feels his, wait, 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 wait. Rubies, emeralds, sapphires, diamonds. It wasn't a dream. The legend's true. The legend's true. So he doesn't want anyone to know about it. So he um, puts him away. He puts him away. But he knows he's rich now. He knows when he gets back, he's going to own the hacienda. He's going to own the ranch. He's going to own the outfit. He'll be wearing the sombrero tan galan. His life is over this way. That way is going to be better. So out west, let me tell you, there's the code of the west. No one would tell you what the code is. It's not written down, but it's absolute. And it organizes and controls and leads the lives of the men out on the trail. Let me tell you about those men. You can call them simple men. I like to call them pure men. Only a few things are important to them. One is they love the animals they work with. Second, they love the land they work on. Third, they love the men they work with. And fourth, they live by the code. Now I told you, no man would tell you what the code is. It's not written down anywhere. There's only one way to learn the code, and that's by working with men who live by the code. So one part of the code says, when those morning biscuits come around, that cookie spent all morning cooking, you take your fair share. You don't take any more, because that means someone down the line is not going to get one, and that breaks the code. So the plate of biscuits are coming around, and Cookie, well, Cookie's a retired man. He used to ride on the trail, but now he's too old. But he likes life on the trail. It's the only job he knows. So now he just rides in the wagon, and he cooks for the men, right? So what happens is he's coming along, and that plate of food is coming along with the biscuits, and The vaquero takes one of those biscuits, oh, fresh off the fire, really good. Wait a minute, I'm rich. I can do whatever I want. He takes a second biscuit. Well, I'm here to tell you, all the men notice that. 
But part of the code says, before you start getting all accusatory on a man and getting in his face, got to give him a chance to explain himself. So they decided he's a good man. He's been on the trail with us for a long time. Must be a good reason for it. We'll let it slide this one time. He's a good man. Then what happens is this. At lunch, the bowl of beans comes around. He serves him once. Wait a minute. These beans are good. And I'm actually kind of hungry. Takes a second serving of beans. Well, I need to tell you, every man noticed that. And they said, well, now it's happened twice. I'm going to have to talk to that man. Late at night, it was his turn to ride herd. Now, I had to tell you how it is. When a man's all in the bedroll and you're going to wake him up, you do not go and touch him because you don't know how he's going to come up. You call his name out. Hey, Vaquero! Time to ride herd. Let's go. Now, he's all rolled up nice and warm in the bedroll. It's a chilly night out on the open plains. And he says, you know what? I'm done riding herd. I'm not going to go. Well, you know what that meant? Man had to ride a double shift that night. Well, I, need, I don't need to tell you what happened in the morning. He gets out of the bedroll. All the men are around him in a circle, giving him that hard look. Now, part of the code says, man's looking at you. You don't be the first one to look away. And the reason is, if you're the first one to look away, from then on, you'll be known as old shifty eyes. So it's a beautiful thing with these men. They'll be looking at each other, and in some unspoken way, they just decide to both look away at the same time. But here's what happened. He looks up, all the men are looking at him, and the trail boss is especially looking at him. You know what he decides? They can look all they want, because pretty soon I'm going to own this outfit. He looks away, and he doesn't care. Now that was a direct insult to all the men. Well, I need to tell you what happens next. Trill boss comes up and says, um, we're going to give you one chance to explain yourself, but yesterday you took two biscuits, two servings of beans, and you did not ride your shift riding herd last night. We're going to give you a chance to explain yourself. Why'd you do that? And he says, well, I'm about here to tell you exactly why I did that, and the reason is I'm rich. And from here on out, I'm done with all this work. In fact, you're going to be working with me when we get back. That's what's going to happen here because I'm rich. And then all the vaqueros started laughing hard, laughing. And <laughs> oh, we knew there was a good reason. You're too good a man just to do that for some dumb reason. The other day when that old bronc threw you off and you banged your head on the ground, made you plumb loco. Uh, you'll come to your sense pretty soon. That was a good story. You're rich. You're not rich. You're like us. You're just a working vaquero. Then what happens is this. He says, no, 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 no. I'm going to tell you. And he tells him the whole story. He saw the falling stars. He spread his horse, took out his boot knife, rubies, emeralds, sapphires, and diamonds. He says, I'm rich. The legend is true, and it happened to me last night. Then over here, Cookie's laughing. Hard. Loud. Now, part of the code says, you better not laugh at a man unless you are willing to back it up. So the vaquero walks over to uh, Cookie and says, uh, hey, Cookie, you laughing at me? Because if you're laughing at me, you better be ready to back it up. Cookie says, yeah, 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 I'm laughing at you. The reason I'm laughing at you is I always laugh at dumb, stupid vaqueros. Well, I got to tell you, part of the code says you insult a man to his face, you better be ready to back it up, or it will be your last day on earth. Well, I got to tell you, all the men, they backed up. And the reason is, part of the code says, two men going at it, it's not your fight, it's their business, let them have it. And the other reason they backed up is because they'd all seen a man's last day on earth. And if you've ever seen up close a man's last day on earth, not something you want to see again, so they just backed up. Well, I got to tell you, the vaquero went real close to Cookie and said, uh, Cookie, are you ready to back up what you just said? Or it is your last day on earth. And Cookie says, oh, no, 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 I can back this up. And then Cookie started talking real quietly and slowly because he wanted the words to sink in. 
Well, then all the men came in tight. And the reason is part of the code said, if someone older and wiser than you is talking, you better listen up because you just might learn something. So they come in tight to see what Cookie has to say. And Cookie says, hey, it's just like this. Here's what happens. I've been around a lot of campfires in my day, and it always comes down to the same story at the end of the night, the legend of the falling stars. Volcanoes love that legend. Who doesn't want to be rich and leave this hard life? But they get so excited about that legend, they don't listen to the second part of the legend. And the volcano says, no, 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 no. There's no second part, only one part. Falling stars, rubies, emeralds, there's only one. No, 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 there's a second part. Well, now all the men come in really close, right? And Cookie says, well, let me tell you about the second part. The second part says that the first part's true. But there's more, and this is the part people miss because they're so excited about the emeralds, rubies, sapphires, and diamonds. They miss the part that says, if you let all those riches change your heart away from the coat of the West, all those precious jewels would turn into worthless dust. Well, the Vaquero remembered the biscuits and the beans and not writing her, and he got nervous. He says, no, 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 no. There's no second part, and I'll prove it to you. When he got his war bag and he felt in there, yeah, there's something in there, yeah. Reaches his hand in there, and he brings it out to show them the rubies, emeralds, sapphires, and diamonds. Well, I got to tell you, if you've ridden trail a lot, you hear a lot of things. One of the things you hear is the bawling of the calf as it feels, tss, the sting of the branding iron. One of the things you hear is the snorting and pawing in the dirt of the, of the bulls as they fight for dominance. One of the things you hear is the howling of the wolf and coyote as it sees the full moon coming over the horizon. Well, I got to tell you, those vaqueros had never heard such bawling or heard such snorting and pawing at the ground, or heard such howling as they heard come out of that vaquero when he opened his hand and all that fell out was worthless dust. Now, I tell you this story for a reason. You're up here in the mountains. You look like adventurous people to me. You might be camping one night. And you might see some falling stars come flowing down. And you might find out that the first part of the legend is true. But I'm here to tell you the next morning, when that plate of biscuits come around, only take one. <laughs> you. My name is Angel V. Hill. Thank you for being such a great audience. Thank you so, so, so much. Thank you so much for coming. If you got a